on camera. Today is June 26, 2017, and my name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History and Genealogy here at the History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. George Harrison, who served in the U.S. Air Force during conflicts in the Far East and Middle East. Mr. Harrison's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Harrison, and thank you for participating in the project. Would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live, please? Yes, George Brooks Harrison. Uh, I live in Peachtree City, Georgia, and have for about 10 years now. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your early life? I uh, started out in Greenville, South Carolina, born at St. Francis Hospital, which no longer exists. Uh, the middle of two, three brothers. Uh, grew up uh, in a rural setting. My father was uh, a steam fitter, which is a profession within the plumbing business. Uh, we owned a farm, about a 60-acre farm. Uh, lived out in the country. I went to a very small school, Malden High School it was called, but it had all 12 grades in one building. My wife says it was a one-room schoolhouse with all 12 grades in one room, but that's not exactly right. Uh, attended that school for nine years and it became obvious that uh, the academic program that they had, being a country school, wasn't going to satisfy the things that I needed. So my mother uh, spent a lot of time and effort, I can't even tell you how she did it, and got myself and my brothers at various times admitted to Greenville High School, which was the in-town high school. Malden High School had a mandatory curriculum of two hours of agriculture every, every day for the last three years of high school, and of course that doesn't help you get any academic credentials. So I transferred or went to Greenville High School, uh, primarily an academic curriculum. I was able to take things that weren't offered down at the small school, like trigonometry and geometry and advanced algebra, those kinds of things, uh, and did reasonably well. Uh, was a National Merit Scholar, uh, had an appointment to the Air Force Academy an appointment to the Coast Guard Academy and a Naval ROTC appointment to Columbia University. Did all of that because uh, our family, as you might, as I may have indicated, was certainly not wealthy. As a matter of fact, we'd, these days we call them poor. Uh, but I knew that I wanted to go to college. I knew that I wanted to, to move on beyond that. So I spent a fair amount of time and also had a scholarship to the Citadel. Uh, spent a lot of time and effort making sure that I could go to school. I had become enchanted with the idea of flying airplanes while I was in high school, worked at the local airport. Uh, through Civil Air Patrol had a solo flight scholarship and soloed on my, I guess, just after my 17th birthday. Uh, so enjoyed flying, chose the Air Force Academy and let the other scholarships go. Um, spent four years at the Air Force Academy graduated, went to Air Force pilot training. That's quick and dirty on the first, uh, I guess I was 17 when I entered the Air Force Academy, almost 18, graduated when I was 21, almost 22. What was that experience like uh, at the Academy? Yeah, we used to call it a $10 million education shoved down your throat a nickel at a time. So, <laughs> so there it was, it was, uh, it was pretty intense. And I think it prepared me pretty well for all the other things that, uh, that have gone on in my life. Uh, the Honor Code, of course, is a very strong fundamental of everything that you do at the Air Force Academy. And uh, the hope is, and I think the, the truth, the fact, uh, in large measure, is that carries on through the rest of your life. The academic curriculum was reasonably demanding, I think, uh, the normal academic load at a liberal arts institution, engineering institution, is 16 to 18 hours a semester. There the normal load was 21 academic hours per semester. So we graduated, I think I had about 230 semester hours of college credit when I walked out the door after four years. And 
that stood me in good stead later on because a lot of the courses that I took, a lot of the things that I did, uh, qualified me to enter almost any graduate school in the nation. So that was, uh, you tend to think of service academies as being places where uh, where you do a lot of marching, a lot of yes sir and no sir and that sort of stuff. But I think the academic part was as intense as any place that I know of. It was, it was useful and it was rigorous. Fortunately, um, on the popular term now is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, very strong in that area with a good liberal dose of humanities, uh, mandatory course and philosophy as a matter of fact, which is unusual for an engineer. So I think the experience stood me in good stead as with most folks, a lot of the things that I did in college uh, I've never used, never had anything to do with, but that background I think is useful. So it was a good experience. It really was a good experience. So you went on to pilot training. I did. Yeah, from there to uh, Moody Air Force Base. Uh, you know, it's funny how you make choices. I chose Moody Air Force Base because it was close to home, South Georgia, South Carolina, and I could go home every once in a while. Um, went through pilot training. Uh, it's a long story, but at the end of pilot training, I ended up being assigned to MacDill Air Force Base uh, to fly the F-4 Phantom, and then uh, the career followed from there. Were, uh, it, did you have much influence in, in the type of aircraft that uh, you would be flying? Kind of funny the way that worked out. Uh, at the time I graduated from pilot training, the Air Force was in the process of phasing in the T-38 Talon as the advanced trainer, phasing out the T-33, uh, a first generation jet. Moody was one of the bases that retained the T-33, so I went through advanced training in T-33. Somebody in the Air Force, one of they, had made the decision that T-33 graduates, T-Bird graduates, would not be eligible for an assignment to a fighter. So, because the T-38 was fast, supersonic, modern, so all those fighter assignments would go to those guys. Uh, I wanted to fly fighters, so I was a little disappointed, but I chose a C-130 as my assignment out of pilot training because it was in the same command, tactical air command as fighters, and in my naivete, I thought, well, I could probably figure out a way to move across. Uh, it turned out that there was a class of F-4 initial trainees that through some mistake had not been filled up. So in my assignment, as I was sitting at pilot train at Moody waiting for my time to report for my assignment, I happened to be on the desk when a call came in from the Air Force Military Personnel Center, said we need five volunteers out of the six that just graduated from Moody. We're going to C-130s. We need five volunteers to go to F-4s at MacDill instead of C-130s. I said, no, you just need four volunteers because you've got one slot filled. I called the other, tried to call the other five guys. I only got hold of four of them. One of them was on his honeymoon, so I couldn't contact him. He ended up going to the C-130. The rest of us went to the F-4, and that's the way that happened. Absolutely. That's interesting. The right place, right time. Just happened to pick up the phone. So I did go to the F-4, went to MacDill, checked out, and then pressed on from there. So from there you went to your first duty station? That was my first duty station. Okay. The F-4 was new at the time, so the training was done at the, at the duty station at MacDill. Uh, I guess every now and then one of the things that I do uh, nowadays is I'm involved with the Commemorative Air Force down at Peachtree City, Falcon Field. We conduct tours of uh, our World War II artifacts, our airplanes, those kinds of things. As a matter of fact, I think I met Sue down there at one of our events. Uh, we conduct tours and we talk a lot about technology and the advancement of technology, how aviation has progressed. And I occasionally mention to young folks that uh, almost exactly 60 years after the Wright brothers first flew, in 1963, I was a lieutenant at an F-4 Phantom at 38,000 feet going two and a half times the speed of sound. 
kind of an incredible thing. 60 years of progress and it got to that point. So yeah, I went through initial training in the F-4 at that point. Where, where was the first squadron you went to? 557th Fighter Squadron at MacDill. Okay. So I went through training with, uh, I think it was a 4453rd Combat Crew Training Squadron. Numbers aren't really important. But then we just moved down the ramp to our operational squadron. What was, what time frame was that? That was 1963. Okay. So Vietnam really wasn't hot. Vietnam that wasn't though. going. The Cuban crisis had just okay. happened the year before while I was in pilot training, as a matter of fact. And at the time, we were still, uh, obviously, we were in the training state. We were training, getting, uh, getting combat ready in the F-4. But we were still involved with the Cuban targets, uh, just as if or in case something popped back up. As a, a fighter squadron in a relatively peaceful environment, what I mean, I know you're always training for combat, but what does that mean? You know, what does a fighter squadron do? In um, we worked about five and a half days a week. Normally, you'd go into, go into the squadron at whatever time. You'd fly about four or five times a week. Uh, the flying involved all of the things that any flying training organization, any training organization has to do, instrument training, formation training, uh, acrobatics, and then the most important thing was the, for us, was the gunnery range. We say gunnery, it wasn't all guns, some of it was bombs. We dropped bombs at Avon Park uh, in central Florida within a target range there. And probably, you'd probably go to the range twice a week and do the standard, uh, the events at that time were dive bomb, skip bomb, uh, rockets, and then come back and land, debrief. Uh, Florida in the summertime was pretty hot. <laughs> and I think most guys, uh, even though uh, those air, that generation and of course now, are air conditioned and pressurized and all that kind of stuff, you'd probably sweat off three or four pounds in a flight. Okay. What about after that? How long were you there? Uh, I was actually there through the end of 1965, but in the middle of that uh, that time, uh, it's, it's a long story that's not worth going into, but uh, the Air Force had a requirement to provide 10 jump qualified forward air controllers to each infantry or from each squadron so that every infantry battalion in the U.S. Army could have access to a forward air controller. <coughs> Pardon me. So uh, as part of that process, I went to the Air Ground Operations School, which qualified me to be a FAC, forward air controller, and then went to jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia. Since I was a jump qualified FAC, as Vietnam began to crank up, a levy came down to send, uh, in our squadron's case, two jump quali or two qualified forward air controllers uh, to Vietnam, primarily to work with the Vietnamese Army. So Bob Newberg and I uh, packed up our bags and went to Saigon, then went to Benoit, checked out in the Bird Dog, the 01, which you may be familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this was a temporary duty tour. We weren't reassigned to Vietnam. We were sent there for supposed to be a maximum of six months, 179 days. Um, so I did that, finished that, uh, that stint and came back home, requalified in the F-4, and shortly after I got back home in 65, the 12th wing, of which the 557th was a part, was alerted for a unit move. Of course, you may recall that uh, in 65 was when the big buildup began. I believe the Marines landed at uh, China Beach in about, gosh, March of 65 while I was flying the bird dog out of Da Nang. Uh, Things cranked up and we deployed the entire wing, less one squadron to uh, f three squadrons of F Force to Cameron Bay in, gosh, October of 1965. Was the base ready for that many aircraft? Uh, the runway was. The runway was, okay. We had, uh, we initially lived in tents and had a mess tent, all the things that uh, 
that a lot of GIs are familiar with, with the standard mess kit that you dipped into the trash can full of boiling water after you ate. Uh, we, I guess within about two months, had uh, metal Quonset huts with plywood floors, uh, 60 guys in a Quonset hut with all the pristine neatness that 60 unaccompanied males can, uh, can bring to the fray. Like an oven? Uh, like an oven and like a gym locker. Well, let me let me go back just a little bit to the to your tour with the Vietnamese uh, army. Yeah. What was what was that like? I mean, you had, up to that point you had been pretty much uh, uh, not involved with the dirt. No, I wasn't. Uh, you now, part of our Air Force Academy experience, our first summer, was a thing called forward airstrip encampment. We lived in tents, wore helmets, fired our M ones. Uh, did all those, I had a couple of tactical problems, which I'm sure are nowhere near uh, the quality of infantry training that a good infantry officer would get. But at least I knew what a rifle was, I, and I was fairly good with the M1, later on fairly good with the M16, so we, that was okay. But as far as, as far as knowing anything about infantry tactics, uh, those kinds of things, I knew how to pay attention to the Sergeant Major, pay attention to the regimental senior advisor, and how to call strikes, how to get the, how to get the air power onto the targets that we needed. So you you maneuvered with Vietnamese infantry units. Actually, I didn't maneuver because we were in a static position, okay. so I was not out in the bush. As uh, were you able to communicate with uh, your communication was a real interesting experience at that time. Uh, the U.S. was maintaining the fiction that we were advisors, we were not combatants. So when I was flying as a forward air controller, I had to have a, the bird dog is a two -seat, little two-seat airplane, I had to have a Vietnamese with me and he was technically the person that authorized the strikes. Uh, sometimes he could speak English, uh, most times not. Uh, we communicated, as you know, Vietnam was a French protectorate for decades. So there was some rudimentary French that we could communicate with. I had taken French at the academy. So while well, I'm no we could get by. Yeah, we could get by. We could communicate numbers, basic uh, right, left, far, that kind of thing, stop, start. So communications was an issue. And by that time, it was rapidly developing into an American war, not a Vietnamese war, or the portions that that I was involved with. So you, you went back, you came back to the States and requalified in the F-4. Yeah. Where did you go from there? Uh, as I mentioned, we were 12th wing, we were alerted for movement, and we deployed then uh, the entire wing to, uh, to Cameron Bay. What was the nature of your missions? We were about midway down the coastline between the North Vietnamese border and uh, the southern tip of Vietnam. So our focus was South Vietnam. We did a lot of close air support, um, a lot of close air support. We went to, we went north out of my, at that time, about 260 missions, I guess. I had 20 into North Vietnam, the rest were, were in South Vietnam. Were you in support of U.S. forces or Mostly, it turns out, mostly U.S. forces, although uh, the way that worked for us, uh, we essentially would check in with the Airborne Battlefield Command Post, a C-130 that was orbiting uh, almost in Laos, uh, and he would assign us our targets. We occasionally, maybe 20 percent of the time, had a target when we launched and went for that target. The rest of the time we were on call. Uh, he'd send us to a forward air controller, usually an airborne fac, and, uh, and he would direct us, smoke the target, tell us exactly where to hit, where to not hit. Um, one of the, I guess, one of the interesting and intense things that we did, you may recall the movie, We Were Soldiers, or the book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Uh, 
Hal Moore was the battalion commander whom I fortunately was able to meet later on along with Joe Galloway who wrote the book. Uh, the Iron Valley battle was a very intense ground battle. Uh, we flew, it was only about a 20 minute flight from Cameron Bay over to that, that area landing zone x-ray. Uh, we flew a lot. Uh, two or three times a day just going over there and it was it was so intense probably a different perspective the troops were in close contact so we were dropping really close to the friendlies and the the hostiles the Viet Cong were on a mountain shooting down onto the onto Al Moore's battalion so as we were it, we primarily dropped napalm in that uh, in that adventure, which is napalm, you drop from 100 feet, 450 knots, and they were shooting down on us uh, okay. on that with some fairly good-sized stuff, not the not the really big stuff, no 85 millimeter or anything like that, but 12.7, 14 14.5, 37 millimeter, all that stuff was coming down on us. Uh, of course, we were in that in that firefight. Uh, in a jet, you were in that firefight for 20 or 30 seconds, and the soldiers on the ground were in that firefight 24 hours a day until it, until the battle was over. So, I have to say, while it was very intense for us, and we lost several airplanes, Joe Rosado was a good friend of mine, and Joe just didn't make it. Uh, he had dropped and just exploded right after his right after his ordnance came off. Uh, it was intense for us, but I, I constantly think about how, how much more intense it was for those poor guys on the ground. Can you describe for me, I guess as you're talking about this situation, I'm trying to envision in my mind what it's like for a person in a high-speed aircraft trying to find a spot on the ground and get his ordnance on it. I mean, I. A friend of mine was an F-4 pilot, and I remember talking to him about it, and I couldn't ever quite appreciate the stress and, and what it took to get that ordinance in that place. Well, of course, as I mentioned, our training in the States was always, we dropped a lot of stuff, a lot of training ordinance. So you pretty well knew if you, if you could identify the target, you could put iron on it. Okay. Uh, the reason we use napalm instead of high explosive bombs is because you can bring napalm closer in. Uh, high explosive bombs, of course, have a huge frag pattern, fragmentation pattern. Uh, the napalm, uh, if you drop parallel to the friendlies, the napalm spread is not into the friendly lines. Right. The ground fac, Charlie Hastings was the fac on the, in that particular battle. Uh, the ground fact was talking to us a lot. He was helping us identify where the friendlies were, what the ground landmarks looked like. And of course, Charlie was a, a fighter pilot also. Matter of fact, he was out of our squadron. Uh, so he knew what we could see and what we couldn't see. It's no point in telling a guy to go to the bend in the river. Right. There's a lot of rivers and a lot of bends. So he could talk about that. And of course, he, he used, we used smoke a lot. Okay. He would pop smoke. And uh, one of the little tricks that everybody learned very quickly, he would pop smoke and the fighter pilot would call the color smoke. Instead of saying, pop some yellow smoke for me, if you called out, pop yellow smoke, a lot of folks were listening to the radio and you'd see a lot of yellow smoke all over the place. So he would pop smoke and say, Roger, Charlie, I got your purple smoke. And yeah, that's my smoke. And you'd go in and he'd say, uh, put the napalm 30 meters north of the smoke, put the napalm on the smoke, wherever okay. he wanted it. So yeah, it, uh, target identification is a little bit different deal and it's a different perspective from, from those air speeds, particularly at the, at the low altitudes where you're dropping the, dropping the napalm or strafing. Uh, things go by pretty fast. 450, 450 knots was the typical drop speed. Uh, and of course you, without going into boring detail, you have to be precise on altitude and airspeed because that determines the ballistics of whatever it is that you're dropping. If you're too slow or too fast, it's going to drop either short or long. If you're too high, it's going to drop short or long. So you've got to 
pay attention to flying the airplane as well as what the what the gun sight or the bomb sight's telling there's you. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for the pilot, there's a lot but, going so, on. But since, again, you train a lot, so a lot of those things you know how to do, and you do that automatically. It's just okay. like reloading an M16. It's very complex to reload an M16, you know, pull the charging handle, get the, chain, get the clip in. But you've done that a lot, so you don't even think about doing that. That's just something that you do. So how long were you in country? Uh, I came home in uh, August of 66, so 10 months. Okay. And where did you go when you came back? I came back to Homestead, Air Force Base, Miami, Florida, and was an instructor in the F-4. Of course, we were running people through with the one-year tour policy that was in effect then. Uh, the Air Force made an attempt to, uh, to not send anybody back for a second tour involuntarily until everybody else had had a chance. So, chance, it's kind of a nice term, and until everybody else had, uh, had done, their, done their bit. So the training routine back in the States to get people qualified in the airplane and qualified to go to war was a fairly intense uh, turnover process. So I was an instructor in a replacement training unit, uh, getting new guys, checking them out in the Phantom. Was the pipeline always filled? As far as we were concerned, it was, yeah. Uh, we had a lot, of course, I did a lot of other things. I think uh, airplanes needed to be replaced, too. And the replacement training unit instructors, and there were probably six RTUs across the, across the United States, uh, we would get tasked frequently to deliver an airplane from heavy maintenance in the States to Vietnam. And I probably made 10 trips doing that. Uh, pick up an airplane at Hill Air Force Base, hit a tanker, go to Honolulu, spend the night, go to Guam, spend the night, take it into Vietnam, spend the night, come back home. Uh, a couple of times I brought home, uh, most of the time you'd get on a, a transport of some kind and you'd get back to the States. Uh, twice I brought back battle-damaged airplanes that uh, were coming back for heavy maintenance. Uh, an RF one I remember in particular was an RF-4 that uh, was certainly flyable, but the internal wing tanks were wired off because they were just so damaged they couldn't hold fuel. So all I had was fuselage internal and the external drops. Just a little bit different, a little bit different fuel management process. So how long did you do that? Stayed there until 1969. And uh, at that time, uh, the only assignment I ever asked for in my life, by the way, was this one, uh, to graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania, which was a different experience, a Vietnam veteran at an Ivy League school in the middle of the anti-war business. Did you, did you have any difficulties? Uh, was it was <coughs> uncomfortable? I, found, I encountered some hostility, found a couple of professors, encountered a couple of professors that were pretty vitriolic about my background and what I had done. Uh, were you required to wear a uniform or did you? No. Okay. No, as a matter of fact, we were encouraged to not wear uniforms at that time. Uh, even the ROTC students at the University of Pennsylvania did not wear the uniforms. Mm -hmm. They would go to the armory in civilian clothes, put on their uniforms for their ROTC activities, then change back into civilian clothes because the I don't think there's any physical danger. I think it was just the overall hostility. It's like going through the San Francisco airport the times that I came back from Vietnam. I don't think I was in any physical danger so much as, I mean, nobody ever got hurt with a tomato hitting them. There was, there was just a lot of, uh, a lot of ugliness, a lot of hostility. There certainly weren't any parades, welcome home. It was, mm -hmm. uh, were you able to fly while you were at Penn? Yeah, I did. As a matter of fact, at that time, it's different now, but at that time, uh, to draw flight pay, which was whatever it was for me, $150 a month, 
uh, you had to fly at least four hours a month. So I was attached to a couple of National Guard units and I flew with them while I was going to graduate school. And when you, when you completed your schooling, where did you go? Went to MacDill Air Force Base again, uh, this time in a joint assignment. United States Strike Command was at MacDill at that time, and I was a joint training exercise planner. Tony, can I ask a question about grad school? Did you f ever find while you were in grad school that the hostility towards the military in Vietnam affected your grades or how, your, how you were evaluated? As a matter of fact, uh, Bill Gernert, who was another Air Force captain, and I signed up for a course which we really wanted to take because the professor was well known, had a national reputation. Uh, he accepted us into the course and the first day of the class he announced that uh, there were two, and I won't even use the words that he used, people in the class and he said he didn't care what we did, we, we, we were going to get an F. Uh, a valorous individual would have taken the challenge and shown by my excellence that I was worthy of an A. Uh, Bill and I were not quite that valorous. We dropped the course and walked out. That's amazing. Amazing that we dropped the course. No, that, that you were treated that way. I mean. Well, the, we complained, and the complaint we were answered by the dean that uh, professors assign grades on whatever basis they deem appropriate. So there it was. So I, now again, let me emphasize that I was not in physical danger. This is all things that hurt my feelings, not my body. I'm still a little hostile about it. But, uh, but it really didn't affect my life. I think it said more about the people that did that kind of thing than it did about me. I think it's the sense of unfairness that... Uh... Well, it was unfair. Uh, Hal Moore, whom I mentioned, uh, Hal just died, as a matter of fact. He, was, he retired as a lieutenant general. Hal used to say very often, and I think it's what we all ought to think about, he said, hate war but love the soldier because we didn't choose that war. We chose to serve our country and we chose to to do what the country called for. I have some very different feelings about that now, having been a little bit more educated and educated myself about the origins of that war. And for anybody that's watching this, by the way, I, I cannot recommend too strongly the book that H.R. McMasters wrote called Dereliction of Duty. It's just an excellent book and talks about the, as H.R. McMaster, who is now the National Security Advisor, by the way, but as H.R. Re researched it uh, about how things came about at the Washington level, the presidential level, the Secretary of Defense level, Secretary of State, and had that been known at the time, I'm convinced that we in uniform would have done our duty. We held our hand up and we said we'd obey the lawful orders of the President of the United States. And the orders that we were given were lawful. So we would have done it. But I would not have had the same, the same feeling. I really went to Vietnam thinking that what we were doing was helping a a beleaguered little country maintain its independence against an outside invader, the North Vietnamese. I still believe that was a worthy goal. I still believe that was a, an important thing to do. But I don't believe our national leadership had that same goal in mind. I think that uh, between Lyndon Johnson and Robert McNamara, I have hostility toward them. I really do. And I think most folks who have looked into that situation and have a feeling for, for how we got involved, uh, they're, I think most folks have hostility toward him, and I really have hostility toward McNamara. He had decided that that was not a winnable situation early on when only, only 
about 10,000 Americans had died. Another 48,000 Americans died in... I've heard similar comments from other folks who have read the book. I, I have not yet read it. Well, it's next on my list. It's a great book. Yeah. It's a great book. But, uh, well, I don't go to the wall because I don't want to stand there yeah. alive and touch those names that, that died after, after he had decided that their death was futile. Tell us a little bit more about your next duty station. Uh, at MacDill as a Joint Staff Officer, I learned a lot about the Army. Learned that was a joint assignment. Uh, I served with Army officers. Uh, as a matter of fact, my boss was an Army artillery colonel. I was a captain initially and then promoted to major, got to pin on major's leaves. During that, uh, it was a very intense full time. The war was beginning to uh, it was becoming obvious that they couldn't just train people to go to Vietnam. They had to train all the services, had to train people for the other purposes, the other mission, the NATO mission, all those other things going on. So we were conducting, I was responsible for planning and executing large-scale military exercises. Uh, I did three, exercise, three large multi-division exercises at Fort Hood. Uh, Learned a lot about Killeen, Texas. Uh, that was that was really a that was an enjoyable assignment. It was busy, intense. Uh, again, spent a lot of time in the field again. Is was that the precursor to uh, CENTCOM? Yes, it was. That later morphed into CENTCOM. Did you have any uh, experience with? Uh, Southeast Asia, uh, not Southeast Asia. Southwest Asia. Southwest Asia. Uh, not during that period. At that time, Strike Command, they had a geo the command had a geographical area of responsibility, okay. Middle East, Africa, and South Asia, uh, or Asia south of Africa, south of the Sahara, okay. Miafsa, Middle East, and Africa, south of the Sahara. Uh, one of the interesting things. Uh, which I wish the military still did. When you went to strike command, no matter what your assignment was, you were assigned to one of the standing joint task forces, joint task force, JTF-5 or JTF-7. Five was uh, Middle East, the uh, traditionally Arabic countries, and uh, JTF-7 was Africa south of the, of the Sahara. And when you were assigned to a JTF, you had to start taking the la learning the language of that particular area. Fortunately, I was assigned JTF-7, so my mandatory language was French, which I'd already started with. Uh, that made life easier. I'd have been more productive in later years had I been assigned JTF-5 and at least learned a little Arabic. But uh, JTF-7 was my focus. Well, how long was that uh, tour? I was there for three years. Then went from there to uh, Armed Forces Staff College, a middle level staff school. Uh, and following staff college, I went back to uh, Southeast Asia, to Thailand. Uh, the U.S. forces had been withdrawn, and our mission in Thailand then was to was to be ready to support uh, all the fighters. Of course, were out of Vietnam. I mean, fighter aircraft were out of Vietnam by that time, so our mission was to support the anybody that needed it. Uh, our two big, uh, we again, a lot of training, a lot of bomb dropping on Chandi Range in Thailand. Uh, so you were flying? I was flying, flying the Phantom again. Uh, we, Saigon fell I guess about midway through the tour, 30th of April, or April Fool's Day, as a matter of fact. Uh, we flew cover over that evacuation. The rules were that if we were fired on, we could drop our ordnance. If we weren't fired on, we couldn't. So all we did really was contribute presence over Saigon uh, for about three days. And we were... Were you at, at a higher altitude just available? Was that... Uh, actually... 
we got down and tried to maintain presence so that the the stream of airplanes or helicopters coming out of Saigon knew that there was iron available if they needed if they needed cover if, if we saw ground fire we were authorized to drop on it we didn't see any there wasn't any I think the North Vietnamese knew they probably knew as much about our rules as as we did I think they knew that if they fired that we could fire back uh, so we no, we weren't high. We were down amongst them. I think I read in your bio form also that you were involved with the Mayaguez. I was. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, a month after Saigon fell. Of course, that was a real low day for all of us, the fall of Saigon, uh, because it was obvious that everything that we'd been doing for 10 years, everything we'd been doing for 10 years was futile. And we had abandoned the, all of us knew a lot of South Vietnamese. And we knew that we had abandoned them. We just turned tail and run. So that was a low, that was a, that was a very low day for us. But 30 days later, the Laotians, or excuse me, Cambodians, hijacked uh, the SS Mayaguez, a US flagged merchant ship uh, towed it or had it steamed to Koh Tang Island, which is in the Gulf of Siam, about 50 miles west of what was then called Sihanoukville. President Ford made the decision that we were going to recover that ship. So uh, Karat, uh, in Tha Karat Air Base in Thailand still had airplanes. We had airplanes at Udorn, and there was a contingent of uh, of Americans at Nakhon Phanam Air Base in Thailand. So we were all mobilized. Uh, again, we flew pretty intensely. Uh, we refueled, in-flight refueling a lot. We were flying about five-hour missions, I guess, five or six-hour missions, going down and covering, uh, trying to provide cover. First uh, detachment of security police from Nakhon from Phanam. We're going to do the rescue. Unfortunately, their helicopter had a malfunction in all, gosh, I don't know, 30 cops died in that crash. Uh, Marine Corps took an amphibious ship around and they launched, uh, they launched a Marine Corps strike force onto the island. We were providing close air support for them. Uh, they. When we were getting briefed about that, I had flown and taken some ground fire from the island. And in my debrief, of course you always debrief when you get back on the ground, there was a civilian, don't know his name, I said that wrong, there was an individual in civilian clothes. <coughs> I said that I had taken good, accurate tracking ground fire. And he said there is no effective resistance on that island. I said, well, I took good, accurate tracking ground fire. He said, Major, why don't you let the professionals decide what's going on? Well, the, when the Marines were put ashore, they took good, accurate tracking ground fire. It wasn't a good day. We lost a lot of Marines that day, and I, to this day, believe that the people who who decided that us military guys were too stupid to know what ground fire was had a lot to do with the death of those Marines. I really believe that, and I think it's just it's just not a good thing. So once that mission was over, uh, you went back to Thailand. I back. Mean, the squadron. Yeah. What, after that tour of duty, where did you go? Then I went to Eglin. Okay. Uh, went back. To, I can say, by the way, and I have to. Again, I hope somebody someday will be going through this thing looking for key names. But uh, one of the helicopter, one of the Air Force helicopter pilots involved in the Mayaguez rescue was Wayne Purser. Wayne was a first lieutenant at the time in an HH-53. 
which was a rescue helicopter, not a combat assault helicopter. But uh, Wayne picked up two loads of Marines, his, taking them out after the decision was made to withdraw. And his last load of Marines, uh, the island was, there's so much going on that he could not put his wheels on the ground on the beach. He hovered with his rear wheels on the beach and his front wheel, he was holding his front wheels off the water while the Marines came, up, came into his helicopter. Wayne got the Air Force Cross that day, which I think is appropriate. But I guess, I guess I want to say the incredible people, nobody in America really cared about the recovery of the Mayaguez. But the, the airmen and the Marines that were involved with that certainly did care. And those folks certainly did. No one could ask more. Wayne Purser I hold up as a shining example of a, of a young man who, he didn't do it for glory, he did it because that's what Wayne Purser did. That's what a rescue airman did. And he did it. So, there's that. Good. Uh, came back to Eglin. I was the ops officer of the 44, 4485th Test Squadron. Our mission was electronic warfare test, ordnance test, those kinds of things. Um, those were, the beginning of the Carter years, the end of the Ford years, we were short, of course that was a time of re reconstruction, rebuilding or debuilding of the military after the after the Vietnam adventure was over. So we were flying a lot. The operational squadrons were not flying. We were flying because there was a lot of business in the test world. Uh, it was a good, it, it was a good job. Good, became the squadron commander and uh, and enjoyed that very much. Very fortunate to be a part of that because we got to do some really interesting things. So you had, you were able to get airtime because you had the fuel and the tactical units couldn't train. Not so much fuel as parts. Parts, okay. Parts. Parts is parts. Okay. <laughs> you don't fly without parts. You don't drive your automobile without parts. So not having parts money was a big, okay. was a big issue. Of course we had it, the Air Force had it reasonably well. The Army was in dire straits terrible dire straits with all of the drugs, all of the, all the things that were going on. So after, the, after that, where did you go? Um, Air War College. Okay. Spent a year there, uh, maximum. You, at, at that point, you had already had a master's degree, is it? Correct? I did, yeah. An MBA? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you went to the Air War College. What did you? Well, the military education system, is different from the civilian educational world. Uh, the military educational system is a progression on the officer side anyway. It's called professional military education, PME. You start out with a company grade officer school, then a field grade officer school, and then Air War College, which is senior field grade. And the focus is more uh, the logistics of Deploying and equip, or equipping and deploying a force, uh, how you organize a training program, what kinds of strategies you might use, strategies and tactics. Uh, at Air War College, there was a, just like National War College, Naval War College, there's a lot of focus on uh, national policy. Uh, we listened to a lot of people that came down from Washington to, to give us the national perspective on, on this, that, and the other. Uh, how long was that course? That's uh, 10 months, okay. 10 months, and then from there to the Pentagon. I did, uh, I did three tours to the Pentagon. Fortunately, all were two years long instead of the standard four years because in each case, um, I was given an assignment that got me out early. Okay. Uh, 
my first assignment at the Pentagon was in the basement of the Pentagon uh, on the air staff. Uh, if you've ever been to the Pentagon, you know that it's a huge five-story building. A lot of people don't even know the basement is down there. Uh, a lot of rats. It had the, I said the Quonset hut in Vietnam smelled like a gym locker. Uh, the basement Pentagon smells like a rat-infested basement. Just a wonderful thing. One of the interesting things that happened to me, uh, we would eat lunch, or I would normally eat lunch at a little snack bar that was in one corner of the, of the basement, and a female Navy One Star would always eat lunch there. Her name was Grace Hopper, and she was uh, Admiral Hopper, Commodore Hopper was the title at the time. Now it would be Admiral, but uh, Admiral Hopper, as you may know, was instrumental at the University of Pennsylvania in building the first practical digital computer. She, at that time, she must have been in her 80s, still on active duty in the Navy, and just an absolutely delightful lady. I felt very honored to occasionally share a sandwich with her at the little table at, in the snack bar in the basement of the Pentagon. Just little things. Yeah. So, what time frame is this now? It's your. Uh, this was about 1981, okay. 82, 80 and 81. So you had you had been in the Air Force now how many years? At that point, a little less than 20. Okay. About 18 years. Okay. Still had some to go. I did, as it turned out. As it turned out. So what happened after the Pentagon? Uh, which, which tour of the Pentagon were you? The, did you meet the? That was the, that was the first tour. Okay. Yeah, uh, I was in selected, assigned, whatever, to be the vice commander of the 37th Fighter Wing at George Air Force Base in California, flying the F4G Wild Weasel, an advanced version of the F4 that was uh, a surface-to-air missile hunter. I did not go to war in the Weasel. Uh, the weasels in Vietnam, of course, protected all of us dumb strikers. Uh, their mission was to go in, attract the surface-to-air missiles, uh, divert their attention or take them out so that we could get in and, and do the bomb dropping. So how long, what, how long was that tour? Uh, vice commander is a, essentially a probationary job in many cases. It's sort of the job that you send somebody to to see if they are a potential wing commander. Potential wing commander. So I did that for a year and then was given command of a wing, 479th training wing at uh, Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. Uh, commanded that, that was a great assignment. Got to fly a lot, had outstanding people, excellent maintenance. Uh, great mechanics. It's good to be the wing commander. It is good. It is good. Uh, I, I really had a great time there. Again, flew a lot. Uh, and you learn a lot. I, it, you may appreciate this. Uh, one night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I was out on the flight line just kind of going around, see what's going on in the flight line 3 o'clock in the morning ran across a, a young two-striper who was changing a wheel and tire on one of the airplanes. And I got under the wing, talked to him, how you doing, this, that, and the other, handed him a couple of tools. And I said, how long you been on night shift? He said, about two years. I said, how long are they going to keep you on night shift? He said, don't want to get off night shift. Why do you like night shift? because there ain't no sergeants out here messing with him, with me. Well, <laughs> that's one of the things I learned. We fixed that. We got some sergeants out on the flight line in, in the middle of the night. So, sergeants need their sleep. Well, <laughs> you know, if you're going to have 19-year-olds out there working right. in the middle of the night, you could have some 30-year-olds helping them, working the problem. And some 40-year-old colonels you can get out there once in a while, too. So how long was that tour? That was two years. Two years, okay. And that's the normal tenure for a wing commander. And what happened after that? Uh, back to the Pentagon for a two-year tour on the Joint Staff. This time, rather than the Air Staff, I was on the 
staff of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I was the uh, Chief of the Joint Operations Division. Essentially, uh, all of the, you know, there are two kinds of planning that go on in Joint Staff. One is the deliberate planning process, where you think about, what if we went to war in, I don't know, Gulistan? and develop a plan for that. The other part is the current operations section, which uh, I was involved with, where a situation arises and you have to come up with a course of action and a plan based on that circumstance. So we did that. Uh, during my tenure there, we responded to a, a number of interesting events. The uh, uh, Seizure, the terrorist seizure of Achille Lauro, for instance, uh, we developed the plan to do that. Uh, we came up with the notion of capturing Abu Nidal, who was a pretty bad guy. We, in almost real time, arranged for the interception of the airplane that he was in going from Egypt to uh, we believe he was going to France, but it doesn't really matter. He was forced down in Italy. He was captured and, <coughs> pardon me, and then things went on from there. I guess the thing of which one of the more intense things, at that time, just as now, there was a lot of terrorism going on. Uh, most of it state-sponsored which is, of course, easier to deal with than some of the current things. Uh, Gaddafi, out of Libya, had sponsored three terrorist attacks, summer of 86, I guess, uh, La Belle Disco bombing in Berlin, uh, Athens airport, and an Italian bombing. It was pretty clear, and Americans were killed in all of those attacks. Uh, Reagan was president, of course. Uh, Ronald Reagan was the president. We started planning a way to, to deal with Gaddafi. And we came up with the, what, about, what became the Libyan raid on, uh, on Muammar, Muammar Gaddafi. Um, over a, about a three month period of time, so that we would be ready to launch, we, the U.S. military in Toto, would be ready to launch that raid. Uh, you probably don't recall, but we did have a two-pronged attack, one on the Benghazi side of the Gulf of Sidra, one on the Tripoli side. Uh, the Navy did the bombing on the uh, Benghazi airport. The Air Force with F-111s did the bombing on, uh, on the Tripoli side. We took out this terrorist swimmer, terrorist training camp, uh, a swimmer facility that was part of the terrorist training thing and put a couple of bombs in his uh, castle, villa, whatever you call it, in downtown Tripoli. Um, we did lose an airplane there. Um, Paul Lawrence and Fernando Rebus Domenici were the two young airmen that died that night. And I hope that everybody involved with that raid remembers their names. You should, you should never, never sit in a headquarters and send people, do anything that sends people to war and not, when they, when they do their duty and they die, you ought to have their names on your mind forever. You should never forget their names and their faces. And I don't. I don't. Uh, anyway, that was in 1986, and Gaddafi stopped doing what he was doing. The Libyan terrorism absolutely stopped, and stayed stopped until his overthrow just a few years ago. So I think that was a useful thing to do, and I'm, that's always hard to, hard to come up with cause and effect. But we did do that. And the effect, whether it was a result of that directly or not, I don't know, but the effect was he stopped. 
he stopped. So I take some pride in that. What What was your level of clearance to be planning uh, that sort of activity? Well, as with all, I had a top secret clearance, okay. but that doesn't mean much particularly. Uh, I had the clearances that I needed to to do that kind of thing. Okay. I'm just curious whether because of the nature of the planning there was anything yeah. higher than that. Well, as, you, as you're aware, uh, a top secret clearance or any of the other funny name clearances simply mean that if the person who holds that information determines that you need to know it, he can give it to you. So I had the accesses that I needed. Okay. So where did you go from there? Uh, from there, went to Europe. I was initially the chief of plans, headquarters, U.S. Air Forces Europe. Uh, then became the chief of staff of U.S. Air Forces Europe uh, for two years. That was my first uh, my first flag assignment. I was selected for the first star while I was at the Pentagon or while I was on the Joint Staff and then back to the Air Force as a, as a newly minted one star. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like a big deal until you realize that all the other generals regard one stars like the colonels regard second lieutenants. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it just stacks up. There's always somebody above you. <laughs> so, okay, so you now have a star and, and where are you? I was at Ramstein Air Force okay, Base, or Ramstein Air Base. In, where, where did you in go West from Germany? There? Uh, from there, I came back to the Pentagon again for my third and last Pentagon assignment as the Assistant Chief of Staff of the Air Force for Studies and Analysis. I was supposed to be the guy that thought about stuff, and we did. We did. Uh, we did analysis of uh, next generation bomber uh, analysis of the things that were required for the characteristics that might be required for the next generation fighter. We did uh, defense suppression studies. We did almost anything that, that required a fair amount of quantitative as well as qualitative analysis. Very interesting assignment. Got to, uh, got to be involved with a whole bunch of things. Began my involvement, by the way, which later on turned out to be useful with the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, which is a civilian group that advises the Air Force on complex problems. But there was. Then uh, from there, uh, I went back to Europe as the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations for U.S. Air Forces Europe. That was the uh, at that time, of course, I'd spent my career, fly, my flying career in the Phantom in the F-4. Uh, when I went back to Europe this time, uh, since I was the operations guy, uh, I was checked out in the F-16. So got to fly the F-16. A lot of people think that generals can't fly single seat. That is not true. As a matter of fact. Uh, That's me in the F-16, okay. and as you see, there's only one seat in it, uh, so it's me flying it. And my wife does say that that is the best portrait of me ever made, because there's a helmet and an oxygen mask <laughs> and a visor, and you can't see my face. So she has a good perspective on this whole, whole glory thing, but that really was me. There I am in the in the Viper. F-16, just having a good time. So you're time. a flag officer at this time. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. okay. two-star. I was a two-star by then. Uh, and I did, uh, of course, the, the big Iraq war was over with. I'd had some involvement with Desert Storm. Uh, one of the things that we did in studies and analysis was develop and take to uh, CENTCOM to Chuck Horner, who was the Air Force uh, commander at the time. We took the modeling and simulation capability that enabled him to rehearse the, the air war. Uh, there was about five months of preparation before the 
pardon me, before the air war and ground war started. And he was able, using our model, which was not particularly intuitive, so we had to provide the expertise to do it, but every sortie in the first 48 hours of the air war was loaded into this model so that we, and we had a graphical analysis tool so that you could see airspace conflicts, you know, you can read pages of printouts, but if you can see it graphically on a big screen, see where the tankers are, see where the fighters are, see where all the players are, you can make some sense out of it. So we did that, and we did, we, as I say, we modeled the first 48 hours of the air war. And where did this take place? This took place at Riyadh. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. In country. Yeah. So anyway, after that adventure was all over and I'd gone back to Europe as the DO, uh, we were involved with uh, the no-fly zones in northern Iraq. Uh, I did go down to Turkey and fly probably 16 missions over Iraq in the F-16. Uh, probably the lieutenants that I was flying with, here comes that general again. We've got to give up a flight so that that dwarfy little turkey can <laughs> crawl in the airplane and bump us out. But it was, it was an enjoyable thing. And I am certainly not unusual amongst my fellow former general officers in the Air Force. Uh, general Wilbur Creech, who was my commander when I was a wing commander, he used to say, you can't lead on the ground if you can't lead in the air. And he insisted that if you had a unit, if you had people involved in a flying mission and you were a flyer, you better get out and fly with them. And you do learn a lot when you fly with them. Um, when I strapped into the airplane, the crew chief strapping me in, he wasn't overawed by the two stars on my shoulder. He just knew that there's another pilot that he's strapping in, and he had a responsibility to me, and I had a responsibility to him to take care of his airplane. And we could talk, Staff Sergeant to, you know, actually Fred to George, as, as required. And when you're down on the flight line working, as opposed to driving around in a staff car in your blue shirt doing a tour, when you're down there working and sweating with the guys, I think, while it's not a perfect way of communicating, it's at least a better way of communicating than some kind of formal visit. And you knew that in the Marine Corps. When, when the general came down with his staff behind him, you certainly didn't stand around and shoot the bull with him. But if he walked up individually to you or walked up to your fighting hole individually, then you could talk to him. Yeah. And he, not only was it good for you, it was good for him because he learned from it. And that's... I think that's the attitude Basic that most. Leadership. Yeah, I think that's what the way most airmen view it as a necessary thing to do. So I was fortunate that I was flying the F-16 and was able to fly it as a as a working pilot during that time period. So what was next? Uh, next was the Air Warfare Center again back at Eglin uh, as a two-star. Uh, I was responsible for most of the of the combat air forces, electronic warfare activity, a lot of weapons activity, weapons testing. Uh, that only, During that period of time, I was only there for a year, but out of that year I spent uh, five months in Saudi Arabia, again on a temporary duty assignment, pulled out of there as the commander of the Joint Task Force in Southwest Asia, which was all of the residual force that was left after the after the Desert Storm withdrawal. I had uh, a coalition force of uh, French, British, and American airmen. Of course, we had the RC-135s doing the intelligence gathering over that area. Uh, we had, at our, under our operational, under my operational control, I had uh, ground, our sub-launched and uh, sea-launched cruise missiles from the Navy had two carriers uh, in the Arabian Gulf that were under my operational control. So I, I was the... Kahuna. Well, I mean, obviously everybody's got a lot of bosses, a lot of supervision, but I was a senior military officer in Saudi Arabia directly under the, 
uh, the CENTCOM commander at MacDill, and then right above him, of course, General Powell, Colin Powell, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So I got a lot of phone calls. Well, while you were in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, what was the, I'm sure you interacted with the uh, the senior leader, senior Saudi military. Yeah, and, and yeah my Saudi. primary contact was Lieutenant General Bahari, who was the chief of the Saudi Air Force, Royal Saudi Air Force. Uh, I did not have a lot of contact. I had occasional contact with the Saudi royal family, which of course is the government. Uh, at that time, we did not have an ambassador in country, so the chief of station was my primary U.S. Uh, State Department contact. But we did have, uh, you've heard the term country team. We had a country team that, that worked problems. Uh, did, did you have a sense of the commitment of the Saudis? Uh, no. No, I really can't say much, won't say much about that. The Saudis, my children can tell you what I say at home, but I'll just let it go by saying that I am not at all interested in ever returning to the kingdom. I am not interested at all. I, I think that it's I would not take my daughters or my wife into that country under any circumstances whatsoever. <clears throat> I was not treated unkindly. Now believe me, I was never, there was never anything that, uh, but not only not unkindly, I was never treated with anything other than courtesy. But watching what went on, the Matawa, the religious police, the, uh, the American friends that I had, the, the conditions, not poverty conditions, but oppressive conditions in which they lived as, uh, as Westerners, as non-Muslim. I just, it didn't appeal to me. Then I, there's not enough money in the kingdom to get me back. See, so we're glad to come back home. Yeah, I thought what I was doing was important and I still do. And I would, if I were still in the Air Force and were sent back, I would certainly go back right. and I'd certainly do my duty. But as a civilian, I would never go back to the kingdom. So what time frame is this now? This was uh, 94. Okay. Yeah. So when you, when you came back? Where... Came back to Eglin, back okay. to, uh, and then about two or three months after I got back, uh, we were again moved to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico and that was my last assignment in the Air Force. I was the commander of the Air Force Operational Test and Evaluation Center, uh, which is responsible for the operational test and evaluation, actually, of all Air Force systems. So I was involved with uh, everything from ICBMs, ballistic missiles, to the F-22, which was then called the ATF, the B-1, uh, the B-2, aircraft systems, uh, command and control systems, the new, what was then the new command and control system for the Minuteman missile, uh, having significant arrangements or involvement in arrangements for uh, overwater test ranges for ballistic missiles from Vandenberg to Inuitok to the atolls to the islands. Did you have many dealings with contractors? A lot. What? Uh, I don't, I don't, if you listen to the media, the contractors are always bad guys. Uh, I mean, you, you dealt with them. Well, two, ki the two kinds of contractors, obviously. One is uh, the contractors who build the stuff, what's called OEM, original equipment manufacturers, Boeing that builds the F-22, North American that builds whatever uh, system they're doing. Other kind of contractors are, it, and those folks are in business, they're building a product, they're delivering a product, and they build a product according to the specs that the government gives them. And our job as operational testers was to take that product, 
say, okay, now you laid down the requirements and the specs 10 years ago, here's the current environment, how's this thing gonna work? And not so much to pass or fail the item, but to characterize it so that when it goes to the soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, they have a realistic notion of what they've got. I mean, it's okay that, well, it's not okay, but you remember the M16, how that thing, the first ones, right. it would jam on 20, if you had a full round of, full clip of 20 rounds, it'd jam on the third round. But we all knew that if you only loaded 18 rounds in there, you could fire out the clip and it wouldn't jam. Well, that's kind of an operational test. And it's important that the soldier know to only put 18 rounds in the doggone clip. I don't care what the manufacturer said about 20 rounds going in there. And the same thing with any other system. Uh, if you outline the deficiencies, if you tell, us, if you tell the airman what, what that airplane's gonna do, uh, it doesn't matter, well it does matter, that that piece of electronic warfare equipment will not jam everything that's out there, but you sure as heck want to know what it won't jam. Right. So that kind of contractor, I think they deliver the product. And I, there's a lot of fussing about how much stuff costs, but there it is. Uh, just parenthetically, by the way, if you buy a new Gulfstream, if an, ex an executive jet, very nice executive jet, uh, you pay about $70 million for that airplane, and then you have to put the furnishings in it, the seats, the paint, all that kind of stuff. So it's about a $120 million airplane. The F-35 that we're going to send our young men to war in, and our young women now to war in, costs about $120 million. People say it's overpriced. Well, not to that young man or young lady flying it. It's not overpriced. It's what they need to do. And I hear folks say that, well, the F-16, the F-15 are competitive. I'm telling you, when you go to war, you don't want to be competitive. You want to win. And I'm not interested in a fair fight. So that's my little emotional spasm on that. Uh, the other kind of contractors that, uh, as the services have been drawn down in a lot of essential ways, there are a lot of support contractors out there doing things that, when I started out as a lieutenant, we would have thought of as traditionally military kinds of things. Uh, we simply don't have in the military these, I, I keep saying we, I spent 35 years there so I can't stop being a part of it. We in the military don't have the manpower to do everything that we need to do. So we have to hire support contractors. Uh, the intel world is filled with support contractors. I just note parenthetically that the two big intel leaks going on these days, Snowden and the young lady that was just arrested in Augusta, those were both contractors. They were not civil servants nor military people, they were contractors. It doesn't indict all contractors, but it just says that it's a different uh, it's a different standard and different motivation. And I, I do have some concern about that. Yeah. I mean, I have some personal concern about how secure things are, how intensely people feel their duty to protect information, protect data. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting little sidelight. When, uh, when I was on the joint staff, you indicated, you said something about security clearances. Um, I did have some pretty dramatic accesses. And my first two or three months there, when something would come up, and nothing ever comes up during duty hours in the middle of the day, something would come up, I'd get a phone call, I would have to get in my little car and drive up the highway to the Pentagon, go in and read the message or get the information, whatever it was. And my boss, uh, the J3, the Director of Operations of the Joint Staff, General Burpee, said, you need, a, you need a secure phone in your house so that you can, don't have to drive in to read two paragraphs. So they came out to the house in Springfield and installed a secure phone. I was, I happened to be on a trip when the folks came out to install a secure phone, my wife being the wonderful lady that she is, 
I said, well, this stuff always comes up in the middle of the night, so the secure phone ought to be in the bedroom. So the secure phone was installed in the bedroom at that time, the STU-2, I don't know what STU stands for, but anyway, the secure phone was in a big cabinet with a motor, cooling motor that ran all the time about the volume of a refrigerator. So there's this refrigerator cabinet running thing that she wasn't too impressed with. And the other part of that, of course, when they called me in the middle of the night, the line was secure, and I had a clearance to listen to what was going on, and I certainly could respond, but she couldn't be there. So when the phone rang, she had to get up out of the rack and go someplace where she couldn't hear me. I thought that was fair. She doesn't. So, <laughs> little bitty things that... Uh, so, so you've retired now. I've retired. So what, what happened after it? And also, tell us a little bit about your family. A little bit. I know you, you're married. and you. I'm married. Been job. married. Uh, November will be uh, 54 years, as a matter of fact. And she has uh, Penny, P-E-N-N-I-E, Penny, has certainly done her share to keep this thing going. Uh, in my 35 years in the Air Force, we moved 23 times. And, of course, uh, when I went to a new assignment, I didn't go in and say, I, in a couple of weeks when the house is settled, I'll go to work. I went in and went to work, and she took care of the house, took care of the kids. Uh, the children, of course, uh, two girls and a boy. Uh, they did all that. They moved. They had all the, all the things that, uh, that are tough for kids, moving from school to school, uh, my oldest daughter uh, was in junior year in New Mexico, senior year back in Virginia. Uh, they all handled that pretty well. Going to Germany, my youngest daughter, uh, when we went to Germany the first time, she was pretty sure that was the end of the world. And she decided that she would, for the rest of her life, in mourning for having to leave America, she would only wear black. Fine. Uh, they decided that two years in, after two years in Germany that going to Paris to shop and to the Alps to ski and this, that, and the other, that was okay. So when we headed back home, having to go back to America was, she would wear black in America forever because she had to leave Germany. So, you know, kids are kids. But they did it very well. They handled it well. They all, uh, they're all productive members of society. Uh, very good kids. Good. Just they're not kids. They're all in their. I guess they're all in their forties now, and all doing very well. And most importantly, for any parents that may randomly watch this, they're off my payroll. That's right. So. So about you? I mean, after retirement, what did you do? Uh, I went to. Uh, I interviewed in several places and decided to take a job as the director of the electronic systems laboratory at the Georgia Tech Research Institute, which is a part of Georgia Tech. Uh, stayed in that job for a while and then became the Director of Research Operations, which is the overall... I'm not a scientist, by the way. I'm a management drone. So, uh, at that time, we were doing about $100 million a year in sponsored research. Now we're doing about $350 million a year. So we're growing, and all of that is outside money that comes into the state of Georgia. Uh, we hire a lot of scientists and engineers. Uh, I am not a PhD, but I have a lot of PhDs that I have supervised and worked with. And strangely enough, in the academic world, I can be on a PA, I can't be a PhD advisor, but I can be on a PhD committee and pass on the qualifications of a PhD candidate. So I've done that several times. And uh, I mentioned the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board. I was a full member of the board for eight years, I guess, and I'm now a consultant to the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, which has kept me involved with the Air Force, uh, particularly the, the techie side of the U.S. Air Force, along with a fair number of other, other things. I do some volunteer work. I'm on a couple of charity boards, mostly having to do with veterans and Air Force affairs. Uh, Air Force Museum of Aviation, for instance, or the Museum of Aviation down at Warner Robins. I'm on that board. I'm the chairman of the the board of the Georgia Aviation Hall of Fame. Uh, 
I am a flight instructor, civil flight instructor, and I do a fair amount of that. I still fly airplanes. As a matter of fact, I, let's see here, if I can find it, I brought a picture of my little airplane, a Swift, okay. which is a, is that a show? yeah, there it is. It's a two-seat, side-by-side, all-metal, retractable gear, acrobatic, goes upside down, and just has a big time. So life's good. Okay, we're coming to the closing here, but there are two things I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, bring up. One is you've had a very varied career. I have. What was the highlight? What did you perceive as the highlight? And secondly, at the very end, we'd like to give the vet an opportunity, it's editorial time, to, to speak about whatever subject and make whatever comment um, they prefer. So. I think it'd be hard to pick out a highlight. I think I was able to do some things that I thought were, that were useful on the national level. I think that I was able to do some things that were useful to the people that I worked with, worked for, and who worked for me. I think, uh, I think the most intense times were the times when I had to deal with, with, with tragedy. While I was a vice commander at George, we lost an airplane, DJ Ward went into the desert and Penny and I had to go and tell his survivor about that. Don Dan, while the squadron commander, Don Danborn, uh, smacked it, actually ejected seconds before impact, smacked into the Florida, Florida plains. He was I was able to verify that he was alive as they brought him off the helicopter into the hospital and then I, Penny and I went to his wife Peg and, and had to tell Peg that, uh, that Don was in pretty shabby shape. Turns out he did survive, but those were, I think the casualty notifications, which is the responsibility, absolute responsibility of a commander. I think those casualty notifications were the most intense. I mentioned uh, Paul Lawrence and Nando. Uh, I think those were the most intense times when I had to deal with with those kinds of things. Uh, the McMaster book, I, I guess I'll editorialize about that. When they were talking about in the book he was relating the conversations about the North Vietnamese buildup of air defenses. And one of the civilians in Washington made the comment that if they put in surface to air missile sites, we'll just send in airplanes and take them out. And we shouldn't have more than a 2% loss rate. I've been on 2% days in North Vietnam. That means two airplanes out of a hundred went down. That means in the Phantom, four guys are dead. That's a hundred percent to those four guys, hundred percent to their families. And to coldly, callously talk about a two percent loss rate, turned out, by the way, when we first went after that SAM site, that it was about a twenty percent loss rate. But people that don't, uh, I don't mean that you shouldn't do your duty as a commander. Don't mean that at all. But I do mean that you have to feel, you have to feel very intensely what that's doing to the people that, that you're sending. And some of the folks that, uh, some of the folks that make decisions are very bloody minded about that kind of thing. They don't care about the human cost. And I don't think that anybody in Washington ought to be making decisions without understanding the human cost. I, I think that's important. I think that's probably one of the things that we're missing and probably missing in some extent because we really don't have much military experience in Washington these days. I think those folks ought to every now and then have to think about it. They ought to have to go to the funerals. 
Or the hospital, at least. Yeah. Well, the hospitals, you can be pretty pretty callous about that. You know, say, gosh, you're a brave young Marine because you're going to function the rest of your life with one leg, but you're talking to a human being. But going to the funeral and having to kneel down in front of the widow and hand her the flag, that's pretty... Folks ought to have to do that. So that's my editorial. Okay. That we need people to understand the human cost and what what we're doing. Well, we want to thank you for participating. That was a great story. Uh, you have very much to be proud of. And also, thank you for your service. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you for your service. Okay. Did you? Thank I'm you. sorry. Did you have any questions? No, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Just hold still, Tony. Don't move. <laughs>